Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to the Spark File, your one-stop trick-or-treat, smell my feet, give me something good to eat for creative inspiration. (laughs) And if those noises did not scare you away, I'm Lauren Camion. And I'm Susan Blackwell. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. You may be asking yourself, what exactly is a Spark File? Where do I get one? What do I file in it? These are such good questions, and we have got answers. Mm -hmm. A Spark File is a place where you consistently collect all of your inspirations, and your fascination. Here's the dealio. We are makers. We make all kinds of things. And if you're like us and you're making stuff all the time, or you want to be making stuff all the time, you already know sometimes the wellspring of inspiration can run a little dry. So we're on the lookout for fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark our creativity and pique our curiosity, things that inspire us to get up off of our asses and make things like this podcast. Or a sacred pilgrimage to a spirit-filled destination. Uh, (laughs) Or a performance so terrifying that it made me pass out. Stop. Just you? Just saying. Oh, Lord. Every episode, we're going to reach into the spark (laughs) file, and we're going to exchange some sparks. And from time to time, we're going to talk to some folks who spark us, too. And if you're not careful, you might just get your house haunted. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, let's open up the The spark spark (laughs) file. (laughs) Candy, when you were little, did you have that um, Walt Disney's scariest sound effects record? Oh my gosh, I think we did. Yes. All the sound effects. I'm giving you a touch of A creaking of door. If there was that one that was the sound of a very long fuse and then a bomb going off oh. and I hated it. Oh. I hated it because of the, it created that hateful suspense. But oh. um, I feel like I memorized that album. I'm trying to give some stuff. of it to you this episode. <laughs> this is our very spooky Halloween episode of The Spark File and due to some very spooky spooky scheduling considerations. <laughs> this, this episode will be posted slightly after Halloween, but we still wanted to post it, even though you've probably housed all your trick-or-treat candy already, and it's gone. That's gone. It's out of there. Um, but we still... I, I just We're still going to appeal really to the spooky side. Doing a, I wanted to do a spooky episode. I know you did, and I'm glad we're doing it. I have <laughs> nerves. You? I know I'm not, I don't sound convincing. Um, I have nerves because, Susan, as I was like I was fishing for sparks, I made an observation about myself that A, I don't like. You don't court the spooky. I don't court the dark I don't, side. I don't like not, it to have, I don't you, like I it to live we in both my mind. In, I think we both can. Um, enjoy a dark spark of course but of course. a like a spooky haunted scary violent 
just for the sake of being spooky. Yeah. I mean, I think always dark sparks fascinate me, yeah. but I, I was thinking about like, if we were at Hogwarts, I would be like, I don't want to know the dark arts. I just don't want to know the dark arts. No. I don't want to learn those. Yeah. Yeah. But guess who fares really well? The people who do. And then they, cause you can't really combat something that you don't know anything about. Yeah. So and needed to open my mind a little bit. I know there's something though I enjoy. I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before. <laughs> I am too scared to watch scary things. Yes. It's not, it's it. The minute a violin starts going, like the minute that tension starts, I, f I flip my shit. Yeah. <laughs> but what I do enjoy is either I read the synopsis of scary TV shows and scary movies on Wikipedia. Wow. I seek them out and I read them. Okay. And I like to listen to the read. I have my friend Tom Schulteis. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, our friend and colleague, Tom Schulteis, he will watch scary things that I can't handle, scary things, haunted things. And then he'll tell me the story like he's telling me a ghost story and that I really enjoy. What is the desire to like know the story yeah. but not experience yeah. the story? Yep. That's right. Okay. That's that right. makes sense. So I think we talked a while back about did we about the movie us? And I was like, I think it's too scary for me. I don't need to see any scissor violence. I don't want that. But I did yeah. go and I read the plot synopsis because I want to know what the world is talking about. Yeah. I don't like to imagine violence. I don't like, you don't even like that. I don't like a Tarantino films, which we've talked about uh, before. That's like rough. there's some really smart and fascinating aspects to his work. And then there's always like a 12 minute, brutality showcase and I'm like no no I'm with I you. didn't need that I'm with you I don't yeah it's, it's weird it's weird what I can take and what I can't take and I'm not sure sometimes where that line lies for me but mm -hmm. I know it when I see it Aww. and I it's crazy to me that people go to I have friends who love horror movies and yeah. will go to a marathon a marathon of horror movies oh, or God. watch it at home alone or seek it out and they'll be like, oh, here's a really bad, cheesy horror movie from like the 70s. Mm -mm. And I'm just like, why do you like it? Why do you like that feeling? Mm -mm. But what I do understand for myself is I like I like a ghost story. I like somebody to tell sure. me to tell me in the safety of my warm, safe home. I think sometimes it's like, is it engaging on an intellectual side? Um is it making my mind, you know, question things and broaden itself? Like, that's interesting to me. But just like flying out of my seat because I didn't see something coming or, or a pair I of scissors headed don't like to me. Jump you know, scares. I don't either. No. Did you ever but see that video game? Like. Um, it was like Five Nights at Freddy's. It was a video game. It was a like a scary jump mm -mm. scare horror video game. No. Where you are... Um, you as the player are an employee who has to work overnight at like a Chuck E. Cheese type place, oh, except no. at night the, <sighs> the animatronic animals come to life and you have to keep them from killing you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No. But from a creative standpoint, I read as much as I could about it because I... I was so interested in the making of it and the... I just thought it was fascinating, yeah. like how they did what they did and how they used a video, how they made a horror video game, video game essentially. Yeah. 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 So I'm fascinated by the craft of it. Yeah. But not There's, the witchcraft of it. So I think what we've established is we're both fascinated and scared shitless <laughs> by the things and we're, that we're, we're going to tell we're leaning in this week. Ah, <laughs> um, are you going first? You are correct, Susan. I'm going first today. Um, before I start, I want to give a great big trigger warning mm. to our listeners. There's a lot of ultra sensitive material coming at you in this episode. So if you are sensitive to anything, I mean, we have already um, pointed out this is going to be dark and spooky sparks. So um, if you have any hesitation, I would say turn the dial. Turn back. Turn back now. Beware all ye who enter here. For real. For real. Okay. Um, so I wanted to start my spark by telling you a little story about um, a little trip I took. So I was in Tokyo for work mm -hmm. on one of many like Blue Man trips. 
I think we were, it was opening night of a show so in Tokyo. Fun. Yeah. So super fun. And um, Barbara Darwall, one of the producers and also a friend who I haven't seen or heard from lately. Hi, Barbara, Hi, if Barbara. you're listening. Um, we're at opening night and I remember she says, um, what are you doing tomorrow? Because we all, you know, we would stay a day or two after always. Oh, so great. And I had, of course, failed to plan anything. I would travel. <laughs> you were working. You Honestly, were working. I would were get busy. on a plane and be like, where yeah. am I going? So I, I was like, I don't know. I haven't figured anything out, but I'm sure I'll do something in Tokyo. And she had three daughters and still does. Um, and they, they were teenagers at the time and lovely, wonderful human beings. They're just delightful, all of them. And so Barbara says, um, well, we're going to Mount Fuji tomorrow. Do you want to come? And I was like, well, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> sure. I'd not planned on anything. And I had the last thing I had looked into was like taking a trip to Mount Fuji. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, I, I don't know what that entails, but sure. Count me in. Mm -hmm. And she says, great. Bus leaves at <laughs> 7 a.m. Because this is a spooky Halloween episode. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like, What's Thinking Mount, ahead, Mount Fuji. <laughs> what, what's on the bus? Like I, I'm like looking for ghosts at Susan, every turn. I didn't ask. Like I said, I didn't ask a single question. I'm like, oh, there's a bus. Okay, so I show You're up. You're just along for the ride. I'm t literally along for the ride. Uh -huh. The ride is we get on a bus. It's like a two and a half hour bus ride, and we arrive at a destination where we're at the base like of a lake quite near a mountain and I'm already picturing this as the placid beautiful natural beginning to a horror movie go it's ahead so freaking gorgeous okay. the lake and I love being on boats so I'm like this is amazing and they put us on a boat that is literally like built like a ship from like 300 years ago it's wo a wooden ship and that's whole part of the experience you're creaky. in this old creaky ship and but I was yeah. loving it. I was like, this is gorgeous. If the trip stopped right here, I'm so happy. And they say, oh, but it doesn't stop right here. So we get off the ship. We get back on the bus. Oh. And I'm like, well, what are we doing now? Is the bus haunted now? No, now we're winding up the mountain right. to the top, which, you know, any mountain roads in a big vehicle that doesn't make like like quick, <laughs> short, yeah. sharp turns. Yeah. I was just like, okay. Don't look out the window, but wow. here we are. We're yeah. going up the mountain. Great. So awesome. And it is beautiful. And I'm just reminding myself the whole time of like, when are you going to be on Mount Fuji yeah. again? Yeah. So we get to the top and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to snap a few photos. They're like, okay, great. And then we got to go over there to that cable car. I was like, what? Wait a minute. What is happening now? How many people like, have died on that cable car? You're getting in this cable car and we are going to go on a string from this mountaintop to that mountaintop mm -mm. in a glass bottom cable car. Mm -mm. And I'm just like, I don't like this on a Halloween <laughs> episode of this podcast. <laughs> and I'm literally just like, oh, mother fuck yeah. why didn't I ask a single question like yeah. not one question yeah so we get on the thing and we're literally blowing in the breeze <sighs> the wind we're just swaying back and forth yeah. and there is a tour operator saying things but in my mind I I'm only thinking please don't die just get us I across. Don't wanna, I don't want that to be my headline. Just please don't yeah, die. Yeah. And honestly, now I think it's really good that I couldn't hear her because I think it would have made things a lot worse. Oh, because no. Because at the base of Mount Fuji, there is a forest. No. No. A forest. No. I floated over in a cable car, blown about by the wind, and this forest is called... Aokigahara Forest, also known as Suicide Forest. I knew this is where we were headed. <sighs> Susan. This is so, this is like, dark. This is like real life scary. This is like real life scary. Let me tell you a little bit about Suicide Forest before we get ahead of ourselves. So Mount Fuji is truly glorious. Mm. It's uh, it's beautiful, as you might suspect. And the area around the mountain is beautiful, too. But Suicide Forest, 
it's also known as the Sea of Trees, is really unique. The trees grow very close together. Mm. And they're really twisty and turny. Their roots are like a tangle along the forest mm. floor. Mm. Because all those roots are competing for nourishment. There's not a lot of it because there's not a lot of light. Um, and they come up and out of the ground like treacherous threads weaving throughout the forest. It reminds me of the setting of several movies. Like <laughs> even like the Princess Bride where in the forest with like the giant rats and stuff. It, it seems like the setting of many a Hobbit film. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It looks un, unreal. And all of those roots are covered with moss and there's fallen branches and rotten logs. And so the ground is full of these like shadowy shapes and Ugh. spooky images that with just a little bit of light coming through, like yeah. you probably think you see things. Um, but it's interesting that you mentioned movies because this forest is so unique looking. And there's been several movies recently where they filmed like what was supposed to be Okigahara. Oh, but they were filming in like a dense forest, maybe in Massachusetts or something, oh. thinking this will work. Yeah. Um, but critics had no critics were, were like it. denied. Yeah. <laughs> denied. This is there's this nothing is else nothing like, it. like it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something very singular about the spookiness in this area. Mm. And in addition to how it looks, it's how it sounds. <sighs> Beneath these fallen branches and the rotting logs, the moss, the decaying leaves, the forest floor is made of volcanic rock. Really? Yeah, it's cooled yeah. lava from this massive yeah. eruption in the year 864. Oh, boy. That's right. And so the stone is hard and porous, but it, it's full of like tiny little holes that absorb the noise. And the trees grow so close together that they block the wind. There's very few animals or birds. So what <sighs> most people say they remember is the eerie quiet. Yeah. In a Mental Floss article by Christy Puchko, one visitor described the silence as chasms of emptiness. <sighs> and another person said, I cannot emphasize enough the absence of sound. My breath sounded like a roar. <sighs> That's right. <sighs> so, believe it or not, some people go there to take in this beauty and the serenity. Like hikers walk through it to get a more glorious view of Mount Fuji. There's apparently some beautiful ice caves that oh, people will walk amazing. through to get there. But many people arrive at the entrance of this forest with the goal of taking their own life oh on their God. mind. Oh, my God. Some estimates claim as many as 100 people a year have successfully killed themselves there. Oh. So you can take these walks. There are trails for hikers, but I'd like to describe for you what you might see. So when you arrive there, you might see a group of tourists trying to get a peek at this famous area. You might see a taxi driver dropping off a single person, oh. shaking their head as they drive away. Oh. oh, You might see abandoned cars with the keys still in them. Oh, no. Wallets, personal effects just left behind. At the entrance of the forest, as you walk in, you begin to see signs. They're like directional signs. Signs that say things like, your life is a precious gift from your parents. Oh, God. You walk further down the path, and another sign suggests that you quietly think once more about your parents, siblings, or children. The sign says, please don't suffer alone, and first reach out. Ugh. Onward you go. You begin to notice strings attached to trees, like a trail of breadcrumbs. Yeah. And at least you know that it's been put there by someone who wants to find their way out or is at least uncertain of whether or not they want to yeah. commit suicide. 
because it's so dense in the forest, like you literally can lose your way. Yeah. So you might get in there and decide you don't want to kill yourself. And not but you be able to find your way out. back. Wow. Um, it's rumored that like compasses don't work because there's a large underground iron deposit that interferes with the compasses. So literally walkers might be thinking they're walking in one direction, but they're not. Wow. So you might be following a string deeper into the woods and find that at the end of it, it just cuts off. Perhaps that person made up their mind and they were not going to find their way back. So you walk on and a little further in, you notice you have no cell phone service. There's no calling for help if you wanted to. Wow. There's no reaching out. There's no reaching out. It's dark now. There's barely any light getting through the canopy of the trees above. You might come across clothing or personal items. You might come across empty bottles of prescription pills. Perhaps you turn a corner and you see a body hanging from a tree. Oh, God. Shoes neatly placed on the ground or a body decomposing beside family photographs. Oh, this is so haunted for real. For real. This is so sad. You may even think you see spirits floating over the ground. There have been many literal ghost sightings. (gasps) Apparently, there's an episode of Destination Truth on sci-fi that claims to have captured a spirit drifting between the trees. I'm sorry, Destination Truth. I do believe in finding the truth, but I can't watch your show. (laughs) But I appreciate you. Um, You might see a curse. During a Vice documentary that takes a tour of the forest, they discover this creepy, creepy curse nailed to a tree. It's like a Jack Skellington doll with his face cut off, and he's nailed upside down to a tree like like a crucifixion, I guess, yeah. but upside down. Yeah. Um, and according to the guide in the documentary... They nailed this character upside down as a symbol of contempt for society. No, it's more like a curse. The curse is nailed in. So he believed that the curse, the person who created it had been tortured by society. And apparently it's not uncommon for visitors to leave a curse on the world that they're leaving behind. People often report hearing blood curdling, unnatural screams while they're wandering the forest. A writer for the Japan Times talked about this incident where he heard a terrifying scream like just around the bend. And so he moved as quickly as he could toward it to find the source of the scream. And all he found was the dead body of a man at the base of a tree. And just a quick assessment showed that he had obviously been dead for some time and could not have been the source of the scream but perhaps his spirit was. So these screams are also reported by locals who live in the area. Oh, no. And can hear them. Move. Move. They are thought to be the sounds of the Yuri, ghosts who suffered a violent and unnatural death, as well as demons. So Aokigahara plays a role in Japanese mythology, and it's considered to be one of the most haunted places in all of Japan. So given to yeah. given its like proximity to yeah. the mountain, to Mount Fuji, it's considered by most Japanese religions to be a very spiritual place, but not necessarily in a good way. There are Buddhist monks that have set up altars to try to ward off what they say are like evil spirits haunting the forest that are actually drawing people in to die by suicide Mm. and tempting them in. Um, One Buddhist monk told the New Zealand Herald, the spirits are calling people here to kill themselves. The spirits of the people who have committed suicide before. So it's long history actually goes way back. Okikahara, it's traditionally thought of as a place where Ubisute was practiced. Uh, going back to at least the 19th century. For Susan, that's the 1800s. Thank you, because you know I always Um, mess that up. Um, What is Ubisute? Ubisute is loosely translated to abandoning the old woman. 
It that does not sound good. It doesn't sound great. It alludes to this alleged custom, Japanese custom, oh, no. where an old or a sick family member was left in a remote area to die. Oh. It was uh, apparently only resorted to in a desperate times. Like in the 19th century, feudal Japan suffered bitter famines. Like people were starving to death. Yeah. And in those times where poor families couldn't feed could grandma not feed and care grandma. for. Yeah. Yeah. They would dispose of, Ugh. and some people say infant and elderly Ugh. mouths, which they could not feed and leave them out in the open to die. They would choose a rough and remote location to leave that family member to die, not by suicide, but I'm um, sort of like exposure oh God, to the by dehydration, yeah. starvation. Yeah. Um, some people say it's just folklore, but it's a very, very powerful story. And a lot of people believe that there there may be some, yeah, some level of truth in that. Yeah. But in popular culture, the this area first became associated with suicide in the 1960s. And it just grew in prominence after a few different books were published. One was by an author named Matsumoto. And it was a novel translated into English that was called Tower of Waves. And in that novel, the main heroine is heartbroken. And at the end of the book, I think the heroine and possibly her lover come to the forest to kill themselves at the end of the story. Oh. So it was popularized as an idea with that book in oh. the 60s. And then the other is a 1993 book called The Complete Manual of Suicide. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. It makes me sad that anyone had to write that book. Yeah. Um, in that book, they declare that Okigahara is, quote, the perfect place to die. Many bodies that they have found in the forest have been found with a copy of that book wow. in their possession. Wow. More recently, there have been films like The Forest, and that starred, um, she was in Game of Thrones, Natalie Dormer. Dormer. Um, sea of Trees with Matthew McConaughey and Naomi Watts. And even more recently, mm, there's a YouTuber named Logan Paul. Oh, I knew we were going to meet this idiot in the forest. He took his crew to the site and he filmed an adventure there. They showed a dead body. And I guess I can't get myself to watch the no, video. No, 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 no. I will never watch that. But apparently in the video, you can hear him laughing. Yeah. And there were, to the credit of everyone online, there was lots of backlash. Um... And he took the video down and he sort of halfway apologized. His apology was a bit of a, I'm sorry, but also let me defend myself. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a little bit rough for people to take. Yeah, He ended up donating a million dollars to suicide prevention. Um, and most upsetting was like the lack of reverence, yeah. I guess, yeah. For, yeah. for the people and the families of the people who were there. Um, That's but, all I'm thinking of as we're having this discussion. I'm like, it really does deserve to be treated with reverence. That's right. That's the word. That's right. And interestingly enough, Japan has a very different and distinct relationship to suicide than many other countries. Mm -hmm. um, it, they have about double the suicide rate of the United States, but they're not number one of all the countries. Wow, wow. Um, but they have a different relationship to suicide, it doesn't carry the same stigma as it does in other countries, particularly Christian countries. Um, and that traces back to seppuku. That's the samurai ritual suicide that was thought to be honorable. Right. Not to be confused it's with like, sampaku. That's right. <laughs> no. Completely different We learned different that word. on a different episode. That's a different episode of The Spark File. Um, but they have obviously this, this ritual of um, honorable suicide that goes back thousands of years and, and that involved basically disbal self disbalance Harry, Harry Carey and Harry Carey yeah. um, and kamikaze uh, in the war yeah. so like they have a long long history of it and suicide um, is often viewed as a way of taking responsibility interesting interesting starting in the 1970s they began to have an annual harvest 
four bodies in the oh, forest. Gosh, that's grim. They do a body search once a year, if not more, but once a year to extract the bodies from the forest if they can find them. Brave volunteer searchers, I'm guessing. That's right. That have to, that's you know, right. it's not like going on a Saturday and volunteering to do like a litter cleanup in a woodland area. This is, that's rough. That's right. Yeah. That's really rough. Three decades ago, a Japanese psychiatrist interviewed a group of suicide survivors mm. that wrote that a key reason they went to Okigahara is that they believed that they would be able to die successfully without being noticed. Mm. But other people believed that they wanted to share the same place with others and belong in the same group. Mm -hmm. um, right now there's a trend on the internet that I hesitate to even mention, but it is um, people who are contemplating an online suicide. Oh God. And some people say like the internet provides an outlet for, for people who are seeking like social connection and might be afraid to die alone and there's a potential parallel here, I think, to that same process that by coming to this place where many people have committed suicide, you would die with others in a way. Mm. Like you would not die alone. In a way. In a way. So it's really interesting. It's scary if you make it a scary thing. Yeah. It's a spiritual thing if you make it a spiritual thing. Yeah. It's a... Um, anthropological and cultural thing if you make it a cultural thing yeah um why a place like this exists and japan to their credit is trying to do a good number of things to bring down the number of suicides well those signs are one the I signs mean, are one yeah and they have they also have a lot of suicides on their subway system like oh. if the train breaks down, everyone is pretty much assumes it's because someone jumped. In wow. Front of it. Oh, There's man. enough of those. And, and for a lot of people, like there was a real spike around 2010, the financial crisis around the world, like a lot of people, um, ended their life. And many, many people in Japan thought like, well, the only way to help suicide is to get our economy back on track. Hmm. Um, because it almost like it's completely reasonable that people are doing this because we're living in a world where they can't make enough money to support their family or mm -hmm. they lost all their money and they feel shame. And so they really approach it in a different way. Um, but now I, I guess this is as dark and spooky as I could allow myself to get. Um, I know we've talked on different episodes um, a little bit. We'll, probably talk more in future episodes about our relationship to death yeah. and what it means to be able to choose your own time and place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we are, we do live in a world where the belief is that's wrong, especially if you're Christian, there's a strong belief that you don't do that. Yeah. Or my that you'll my be mind has expanded on this topic a bit. I've done some, a little bit of reading and listening and research to people who are advocates for people getting to have more of a choice, especially if you have somebody who's like terminally ill and they don't want to suffer through to the bitter end. They yes. want to have some choice around it. Um, and I'm, I am feeling that I'm feeling yes. that. And that a, a forest, you know, a place like this is not your only option. That's, that's right. But I'm also struck by a lot of, like I've got a lot of creative sparks popping while you're talking mm -hmm. in addition to being like totally it's it's scary like mm -hmm. um this is like real life scary it's real life scary because these are real human beings all with their own stories of what led them to this place and then what they did once they got there yeah, yeah. there are people who went in with a certain intention and found their way out um there, there's so let, the, mm -hmm. here's some things that are, yes, are sparking please, me. Please. You had mentioned some of those movies that that's right. Uh, are they set there? Are they or they're is, set there? They're so set there. I attempted to watch the Sea of Trees with um, 
Naomi Watts and Matthew McConaughey. And I like you both very much, but I didn't finish the movie. Um, but it was essentially Matthew McConaughey, you know, booking a plane, a one way plane ticket from oh. the U S to that forest with the intention of, I mean, we're led to believe with the intention of committing suicide, I think because his wife had died and he meets a, another man wandering in those woods. Is he a man? Is he a spirit? We don't know. You know what it reminded me of when you were saying that is, are you aware of this project? I'm going to get this wrong. It's either called grass or the grass. Mm -mm. Stephen King and his son, Joe Hill, I think co-wrote the book and they've made a TV series movie out of it. It's either grass or the grass. And it is about these people pull up to they're they're traveling, you know, they're on some road trip for some reason. And this is a good example of one that I saw the trailer for it. And I was like, (laughs) nope, but I'm going to read the Wikipedia. I'll find out later. I read the plot synopsis (laughs) because I wanted to know what it was. And they basically pull up in the middle of rural somewhere on a bright, sunny day, big blue sky. And they're, they, they get out of the car and they hear a kid crying out from the, this grass, this high, tall Mm. grass. And so they go into the grass to try to find the, where the voice is coming from. And they basically get trapped in the grass and there's other souls that are trapped Trapped in the grass and they, yeah. So that reminds me when you talk about the tone and the sound, and yeah. I heard a, I heard a scream, I heard a cry. That's right. I turned the corner, no one was there. But also the way sound does and does not carry, it reminded me of the feeling that I got when I was watching the piece of that program that I could watch, which was not much. Um, Isn't it interesting what the absence of sound can yes, can trigger? In it us? is, and there's something about what you're talking about in that forest with the absence of light. Yes, the absence of sound because it's so absorbed by the porous and all the the vegetation. Yes, um, not a lot of animals. The absence of animals is also Ooh. like that means storms are coming. That That's means right. like the animals have gone to ground. They have the birds have flown away. That's right. That's a really specific thing, and maybe not something you would notice right away you can sense something and then all this but Mm -hmm. what is it it's that there's I haven't heard the sound of a bird like Mm -hmm. it's that is amazing to me and the other thing that I think this is a real this is a spark that I have bumped into before that I think is powerful did you ever read see the play or see the film the woman in black It's a book first, then it was a play. It's ran, it has continued to run forever in London. And it's also a film. I know Dan Radcliffe starred in the film, the most recent version of it. I can picture in my mind the advertising for it. Sure. But I do not believe I've seen it. Okay. So, you know, I, it's hard for, as I mentioned, it's hard for me to see scary things, but because Dan starred in it, uh, we uh, went to a screening. Yeah. And in the swag bag, when we went to the screening, you got a copy of the book. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to read that book. And I happened to read that book when I was home alone. Oh, boy. And at night. And it scared me. It really scared me. Yeah. And the thing that struck me so much about, I really picked it up in the movie. I thought Dan's performance really captured it in the movie was the hauntedness of it, the scariness of it was completely braided with the grief of the main character. Mm. The main character has lost his wife in childbirth at the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. And so they portray that character's grief, I thought, in a very real way, just sort of like the hot depression and the the grief of having mm. to go on after that sort of loss. And there's, there was something incredibly powerful about grief wrapped with terror wow. that made that movie extra sticky. Like it was, wow. I, I was really um, scared by it, but I was really moved by it. And that combo of, 
of visceral feelings was very powerful. Mm -hmm. And your story has that in it. Anything, any piece of writing, whether it's a poem or a, it doesn't even have to be writing, a poem, Mm -hmm. choreography, um, a painting, I feel like it has in it, it's the scariness that the, 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 but it's, it's completely braided with grief, sadness, isolation, loss, loneliness, depression. Like it's powerful. It makes so much sense that pain and fear would go together because if you think about like how much time in our life do we spend imagining pain that we may or may not feel in the future. Yeah. But we're picturing it and we're experiencing it on some level because we're living in anticipation. But what you just said reminded me of, um, I read about a Buddhist monk that's doing this work um, in in trying to, it's interesting because he has no judgment about whether or not someone commits suicide. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so absolutely no judgment, but he's there and he helps people in different ways and he leads a workshop. He will gather people together who are certain that they want to commit suicide. Mm. So certain they are frustrated by the fact that they haven't been able to yet and they're looking forward to it. And in some ways, like yeah. their entire life revolves around imagining when and how they can do that. So he gathers them together and he has them close their eyes and he takes them through a meditation and visualization and starts with the question, let's imagine you were, you know, there is a doctor here who has just examined you and is telling you you have three months to live. And Mm. they contemplate that and he has them write about it. And then he's like, now let's imagine you are told you have two weeks to live. Mm. Let's say you have one day to live. Mm. Let's say you have the next 10 minutes. Mm. And he, it gets me because he says it's, it seems so simple, but that going through that process, usually he's like 90% of the people will begin to cry, will get in touch with other feelings and of their own, by surfacing their own feelings, come to the realization that they have not yet lived. They haven't given themselves, given themselves a chance to live. And that if it were truly to be taken away, there's more that they want to do in the next 10 minutes, in the next 24 hours, in the next two weeks. Okay, this reminds me of an episode that we've recorded, but you haven't heard this episode, listeners, but, okay. but where we talk about why do we have to wait for the diagnosis, the fatal diagnosis, right. in order to make that thing that we want to make before we go or to live in a way that we want to live can we pretend now like we all are going to get a fatal diagnosis, which we are <laughs> like, can we, Some can we live that. as if and make those things mm. we want to make and live those, yes. li- live that life that we want to live. That's right. That's what that exercise is doing. It is. And it's bringing that perspective to it. And if you, again, this monk is like, and if you are still ready to go, that's your I need to choice. know more about this monk and his work. I will, I'll send you some information on him because actually, or maybe I'll do a whole spark on him because I got in so deep on that. I realized <laughs> this isn't happening by this Halloween is, this, this year. This is less spooky. <laughs> hey, it's less spooky. This is so life and- <laughs> affirming. <laughs> That's not what this episode is. <laughs> but I actually do love that it is life affirming um, in a way. And, you know, I know it's not as dark and spooky as our Halloween episode could be, but um, that's what I came up with. I thought provoking, I hope. And spooky. And spooky. Which is the best. Braid it together, baby. And spooky. Did I answer your question about those movies? Yeah. The newer movies? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just was, I wondered because I was like, oh, there's actual movies. There are. I even watched a movie that was called The Sound of Insects. And this is a really arty film 
quite amazing, but not traditional in storyline in any way. True story. They once found a man in a tent in the forest who had starved himself to death. Mm. That is a long process. Mm -hmm. That's quite a commitment to say, not only am I going to commit suicide, but I'm going to do it by starvation. In this way, yeah. And he, um, when they found the body, he had the body, oh, I don't think you can say had possession of or was in possession or near the body. Yeah. They found the journal that he wrote. So this film is literally images of the forest and of flashbacks as best as they can through like just the journal. So the spark for this movie was this, the journal of this gentleman who had chosen to die by starvation. The spark for that movie. Yes. Oh my they gosh, found the journal. Spark. And so then they have an actor just yeah. voiceover. That's it reads the entire journal start to finish and we have these visuals and we see it evolve and he describes what's happening to his body um as he's wow. dying it's did it's you watch intense. it i did did, did. is it, was, it a is it a the sound of feature? insects it is yeah it's wow length. yeah it seems more experimental it seems more like a piece of art it was definitely experimental yeah but it takes me back to legacy because who are you writing that for? You know what the end goal uh, is here. Yeah. You want to leave a record. You want to have people have understand. Mattered. Yeah, and share your story. Every, why everyone wants to share their story. Mm. So I was left with that feeling of um, kind of happiness that someone found it and made another piece of art out of it for even more people to and see. And that life mattered. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Take care of yourself, everybody. Uh, I would also like to say, if you or someone you know are experiencing suicidal thoughts, call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. Mm, I love it, Cammie Ann. Let's pee. Let's and I'm going to scare your pants off. <gasps> Shit. The Spark Bus! If you want a good, scary ghost story, read the book, The Woman in Black, that, that, that all of that stuff is based mm -hmm. on. It sounds like that is the kind of thing that I could enjoy because there's more going on. Again, like in the... It gave me the hard creeps. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, oh. Just in time for just past Halloween. Just past Halloween. <laughs> You're not done yet. You're not done. Um, so I got a spark for you. Oh, I'm, I'm scared. I just want you to know my palms are sweating. I want to go ahead and throw on another um, trigger warning, content warning. If you haven't left yet. I, if you haven't been scared off yet. Um, so, so here's the spark. The world will remember it as one of the most significant horror movies of all time. Sadly, much of the true horror occurred in real life. Oh. I, I feel like I might know. My mind is racing. I feel like I might know. Before and I, don't I go, want to be. what do you think the guess is? Just out of curiosity. Is it Poltergeist? No. The good guess. Oh my God. There's another. Oh so sources God. for this spark include um, a YouTube video posted by a user named David Lamour. An amazing YouTube video posted by Lost Vocals. The New York Times article from 1974 called Will the Real Devil Speak Up? Yes. A New York Times obituary. Um, a wiki. Good old Wikipedia. An article from ArkansasOnline.com called Murders on Main. An article on DreadCentral.com. An article on SaveTheCat.com. But this spark first came to me via a tweet thread from a user named uh, Sadie Doyle, at Sadie Doyle, S-A-D-Y-D-O-Y-L-E. Sadie Doyle is an author who wrote a book on gender politics, monsters, and horror. Her book is called Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers, Monstrosity, Patriarchy, and the Fear of Female Power. And Yikes, that is loaded. It, yes, yeah, Sadie Doyle is a good writer. In her tweet thread, Sadie shared the story of Mercedes McCambridge. Camion, do you recognize the name Mercedes McCambridge? I do not. Ringing any bells? No. All right. 
Mercedes nervous. McCambridge was born in either 1916 or 1918, because she liked to lie about her age, to Irish parents on their family farm in Julia, Illinois. In her personal life, she was married twice. During her first marriage, she had a son named John. And during her second marriage and afterwards, she was sometimes hospitalized after episodes of heavy drinking. But she was able to stop drinking with the help of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> In 1920 or 30? Or- uh, later. When she stopped drinking? Uh-huh. Later. Okay. It was later. Okay. Um, you might recognize some of her work. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Chime in when you recognize Mercedes McCambridge. Okay. She was a stage, film, and TV actress who enjoyed some acclaim. She won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for a film called All the King's Men. She was in the film Giant for which she received her second Oscar nomination as Best Supporting Actress. She was in A Farewell to Arms, Touch of Evil, Suddenly Last Summer. On TV's Bewitched, which I was a big fan of growing up, she played a witch named Carlotta, who is a frenemy of Andorra's. Um, In the early 1990s, she played the grandmother in Lost in Yonkers on Broadway and on the road for a total of 560 performances. She was also... A radio actress. She played Lady Macbeth on Orson Welles' Mercury Theater of the Air. And in fact, Orson Welles called her the world's greatest living radio actress, which I think means a lot coming from I Orson would Welles. I say so. The king of radio drama. But you better be telling her her stage name here. That is Mercedes that really McCambridge. her name? It is. Her given name is much longer, but the, word, the names Mercedes and McCambridge are part of the name. But her real name is like Charlotte Agnes. I'm doing this from oh, memory. Oh, but she Mer- really went by Mercedes, Mercedes McCambridge. McCambridge. But all those credits I just mentioned aren't how you'd probably recognize Mercedes McCambridge's work. You probably know her work because Mercedes McCambridge performed the role of the demon voice in The Exorcist. Oh, yes. shit. Did you ever see The Exorcist, Cams? I did a long, long time ago. How'd you do? Not so great. How Some old of were those you? Images, I, I can't even say. I'm sure I was in teens. Yeah, that would make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to watch it once. It was my freshman year of college. I think it was right around spooky Halloween time, and mm-hmm. they screened it. At Mm-mm. midnight in one of the big lecture halls and my friends were going and they were like, come, come, come. And I was like, I don't do so good during scary movies. <laughs> and I got there and I got so scared. Like the movie started and I was like, oh, no. And I got so scared that I literally passed out. Oh, God. I put my I was like, oh, good my junk. God. Head hit the desk and I and I for I stayed out for the rest of the film. And I didn't lift my head back up until the credits rolled. But I was literally like, oh, no, ka-chunk, head down, passed out. Uh, did anyone, no, no friends were like, hey, Suze, you okay? Think, Let's get you, know, you out of here. It was college. They probably oh thought I was like God. a little drunk. Um, so when The Exorcist was released Shit. in 1973, I was four years old. And it was an immediate cultural phenomenon. Everyone was either reading the best-selling novel by William Peter Blatty, who also served as the screenwriter and the producer of the film, or they were talking about the movie, which was directed by William Friedkin. Can you say the year again? 1973, the movie was released. So I was like two years old. Yeah. But our, you're basically saying like our parents and everybody their friends were like, yep, was, yep, yep, yep. yeah, Have everybody was talking about it. Everybody was terrified of it. And I remember my father, my father, mm-hmm. who they would have no part of that stuff. But I remember him saying, the thing that's scary about the exorcist is that if you believe in the teachings of the Catholic church, which we did, mm-hmm. we went to church twice a mm-hmm. week, blah, 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 Catholic school, the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. If you believe in the teachings of the Catholic church, then this could actually happen, which I think scared the ever-loving shit out of me. And I think it embedded in my brain. And so when I was a freshman in college and we went and that film started, I was like, oh, no. And that's what made me pass out. Like, this could be real. This could be real. In fact, this is, wasn't it supposedly based on someone's real story? Well, yes, it was. And I'm going to tell you about Holy it. Holy shit. The Exorcist is the most successful supernatural horror film of all time. Over $1 billion in adjusted gross sales. $1 billion oh in adjusted gross sales. Oh edging out competitors like The Sixth Sense, Stephen King's It, The Amityville Horror, and What Lies Beneath. 
by a wide margin. I was surprised that What Lies Beneath, I didn't realize that was such a blockbuster. That it even got on that list is kind of crazy. Yeah, and I also wonder, this is adjusted gross sales, how things like um, uh, Jordan Peele's movies and things like that, how, I bet that they're... They've got to be changing the game. I think they're changing the game. Bit. I Can hope I they are. A tiny sidebar here. Sidebar it. I considered doing Amityville Horror for my <laughs> That would have been something. Because um, I also saw that film, mm. and I think I may have read the book. This was before I realized, like, you can opt out. Yeah. You can opt out of all that shit. You don't have to go with your friends to the midnight showing yeah, you of don't this have to, movie. So yep. I'll see the next one. I'll see yeah. the next Merchant Ivory I'll film. I'll be in my wings. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll go Knightley, see Wings I'm of there. Desire, Art House. But I almost did Amityville Horror because after reading it. That would have been a good seeing, double bill spark. That would have been awesome. But after I read it and after I saw it, my mom was like, you know, we lived right like a few blocks down from uh, that house. Off. I was like, I'm sorry, what? And it's like the next neighborhood over. That'll make it's you not, real. But yeah. that'll, that'll make you shit your pants. And she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we could easily five minute drive to that house. And I'm sure we've driven by it before. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's too close. Too real, too, too scary. close. Don't like yeah. it. If you haven't seen or read the Exorcist. I want to give you just a little oh. synopsis. You know, I like to rock a horror synopsis. It's the story of a mom in the film. She's played by Ellen Burstyn and her little girl played by Linda Blair, who becomes the little girl becomes possessed by an ancient demon named Pazuzu. And the author, Blatty, his spark for the demon character was from Assyrian and Babylonian mythology, where Pazuzu was considered the king of the demons of the wind and the son of the god Hanby. So I thought that was an interesting spark. And here's a fun <laughs> side spark. In 2015, the Massachusetts-based wrestling promotion, Beyond Wrestling, their heel faction, like their bad guy faction, was called Team Pazuzu, which I thought was really oh, funny. I thought that was a funny wow. spark. Wow. Um, and here's more fun spark sources. There's a famous image in The Exorcist, uh, and even if you've just seen the poster, even if you haven't seen the movie, mm -hmm. you might have seen the poster or the book cover of the the exorcist, the priest who performs right. the exorcism, arriving at night on this fog shrouded doorstep, and there's a, a street lamp is mm -hmm. the only light source, and there's light, um, a beam of light coming out the window of the house. That filmic image was inspired by a series of paintings by Rene Magritte entitled Empire of Light. And these paintings are very, they're kind of unsettling in a visceral way because they depict this paradoxical image of a nighttime street lit by a st single street light beneath a daytime sky. And I just want to show you, Cami, and what that looks like. So the top is the image from the movie. Uh -huh. And the bottom is the inspiration for the way that shot was lit and set yes. up. But there is something unsettling about Magritte's paintings because it's sort of like this very sort of like cozy yep. street lamp nighttime yep. thing. And then the sky is full daytime. So it creates this dissonance in the, That's right. in the mind of the your, viewer. Your, your mind is literally like, I can't make sense of this. Yes, which I think... I don't know. I'm not an art anything scholar, historian, interpreter. But to me, I f it feels like it's supposed to give you a feeling of dissonance, of, of some sort of unsettled feeling. I think it's a great way to describe it. And I can imagine that every um, horror film director is trying to find ways to set you off, even without you being able to pinpoint, yeah. why do I yeah. feel why do I feel uneasy? Yeah. Um, another fun spark source is a fun, I use fun lightly. lightly. Uh, author, screenwriter Blatty was sparked by a series of real life events that took place in St. Louis in 1949 concerning the possession of a 14 year old boy, sometimes known as Robbie Mannheim. Um, his name was sometimes concealed in the press. Uh, but Blatty read about the story when he was a student at Georgetown University. He tucked that into his spark file yes. somewhere. And he uh, wrote The Exorcist 20 years later and set it in his university town where he had been when he first heard the spark. Hello. Got it? That's amazing. That's a 20-year spark. Get out your freaking spark file. Dust it yeah. off. And remember that just because a spark 
I just shared a spark that I've been sitting on since I was 10 years old. Just because a spark is a vintage spark doesn't mean it's not a strong, That's right. useful spark. And if you're not going to use it, set it free. <laughs> Let somebody else use Let it. Let it go out into the world. Or not. Do whatever you want. It's your life. Live it. Um, but let's get back to Mercedes McCambridge. So when she was 57 years old, she was a recovering alcoholic, and she had a lot of her career and her life behind her. And she gets asked from William Friedkin to play the voice of the devil. And she had a real quandary on her hands because she was a devout Catholic. She had 16 years of convent education. And speaking those vile, blaspheming words would be something of an agony for her. Because just for the listener, this spirit actually fights with the priest, like verbally. Yes. And it is profane. It's profane. It's It's ugly. It's like the darkest. It's highly sexualized. Mm -hmm. It's it's intense. Mm -hmm. Um, Mercedes said, for 16 years, I sat in front of a pulpit hearing about the horror of evil incarnate. And now I had to play evil incarnate. How? After hearing Bishop Sheen say that Satan is the personification of all evil, I can't believe that Satan will sound like Mary Poppins, can I? So I had to think evil. I had to imagine Lucifer. I had to imagine the incredible bottomless agony, the eternal agony of a lost soul. I drew on my memory for that. I've been an alcoholic saved by AA. I've seen people in state hospitals, vegetables in straitjackets, the hopeless, abysmal, bottomless groaning and screaming. I used imitations of those hellish cries. I've been through hell. And I thought, who better than I would know how the devil feels? Wow. Yeah. Talk about That's dark spark. Some self-reflection. Yeah. Um, and digging deep. Yeah. Sadie Doyle. This is the what caught I her, her tweet was a great spark. And she tweeted, So Mercedes McCambridge sits down. She asks herself how she can embody a creature that is absolute pure meanness, endless rage, no soul. And she thinks, Oh right, that's me when I drink. Oh, God. So Mercedes McCambridge starts drinking again for the part. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. She wanted to drink whiskey as she knew alcohol would distort her voice even more and create the crazed state of mind of that character. And as she was giving up sobriety, she insisted that her priest be present to counsel her during the recording process. So she, in addition to the many priests that are represented in the film, The Exorcist, she has another one in the recording studio. Not just someone who plays a priest. On call, real priest. So she said doing that soundtrack was a terrible experience. I didn't just do the voice. I did all of the demon sounds because in The Exorcist, the devil is in the little girl's body and the girl is strapped to the bed. So in recording sessions, Mercedes had the crew tear a sheet and bind her hands and feet to a chair and then roll her near the mic. She was chain smoking because it activated her chronic bronchitis and wheezing. For the wailing just before the demon is driven out, she was drawing on her spark for that was this keening sound that she once heard at a wake in Ireland. Put that in your spark file. She used these moaning cries that she had used when she had played Lady Macbeth for Orson Welles. And she created these groaning sounds by like strangling herself with a scarf. Like it's okay. This is like method acting at its very, very worst. So, and when, okay, there's a famous scene, if you haven't seen it or read it, there's a famous scene where the little girl who is possessed like spews out green vomit and, Mercedes McCambridge, when she made that sound of that violent expectoration, she did so by swallowing 18 raw eggs and a pulpy apple, which sounds so fucking gross. And she then threw it up? Would be like, recorded it? Like phlegmy, like, yes, yes. So she said, she, Mercedes said, sometimes I was so exhausted and my circulation was so sluggish that I wasn't able to drive home. I stayed in a motel near Burbank Studios. My voice was ruined. For weeks, I couldn't talk above a whisper. She recalled this experience as one of horrific rage. And the director, William Friedkin, admitted that her performance, as well as the extremes which the actress put herself through to gain authenticity, 
terrified the director to this day. Like it was bananas what this woman put herself through to access this performance but he's like i thought she was gonna be great i had She's, no idea it's, she it, was gonna do it scared the shit out of him and i've got to say it's really scary it's in the movie very it's scary. very scary and now if it was made now i think we would all suspect that it was some digital help some yeah. you know not they tried william Friedkin tried to do he wanted to use linda blair's voice and then just like use technical effects to like drop yeah. it down and roughen it up and yeah. he said it just wasn't it it was not scary enough it didn't have that wailing so they brought in mercedes oh my god um so the movie wraps she quits drinking again. She gets herself back together. Wow. Movie gets made. And according to Mercedes, the direct, the exorcist director, William Friedkin, promised her that she was going to get a special credit on the film. One of those like with Mercedes McCambridge <gasps> as the demon Pizzazzo or something in some prominent mention was promised to her. So she attends a preview oh, no. and her name is missing. And she's leaving the theater. She's <gasps> devastated. Missing in entirely? Entirely missing. Oh my and God. she's leaving the theater in tears. And William Friedkin tried to explain that there'd been no time to insert her credit. Oh, no. I smell such fucking bullshit. This is bull shit. shit. In 2012 on NPR, in an interview, William Friedkin said that originally Mercedes didn't want to credit, that she wanted the audience to believe the voice was Reagan's, the little girl who's possessed. However, after the film was released, she changed her mind. This sounds like such mm. a fucking spin to me. What Mercedes claimed, and this feels more authentic, knowing the way the sausage is made, was that the studio soft-pedaled her contribution to the film because they didn't want to affect Linda Blair's Oscar chances. That's what I think happened. I feel angry. It is it is angry making. So Linda Blair received her Best Supporting Actress nomination before it was leaked and subsequently became widely known, I think probably leaked by Mercedes McCambridge, mm -hmm. that Mercedes had actually provided the voice of the demon. And by Academy rules, once Blair was given the nomination, it could not be withdrawn. But the controversy about Blair being given credit for another actress's work apparently ruined her chances of winning the award. Well, yeah. I mean, did people, when they nominated her, did they think that Linda Blair made all of those sounds? I think they were just like, this is scary as shit. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they thought. I think it does have to do, all of that has to do with the believability of like, oh yeah, I didn't see anyone else credited. There was yeah. no voice of the demon credited. Sure. It's all Linda Blair. Uh, which and would no be, offense to you, Linda Blair. I'm just saying. I know, saying, but that like, would be an extraordinary feat for a child or moly. anybody that isn't Mercedes McCambridge to make those sounds. If you want to hear what a contribution Mercedes McCambridge made to the cultural phenomenon that is the film The Exorcist, there is a video on YouTube from an account called Lost Vocals, and maybe we could link it to our social oh, when sure. this episode airs on the days after Halloween. Ooh. It shows you Linda Blair's actual performance as recorded on set, and then it's followed by the exact same scenes dubbed by Mercedes McCambridge in the released film, and you can hear it all. The bronchitis, the wheezing. You can hear the drunkenness. You can hear like the drunkenness. You can hear the sound of choking. It is intense. Ew. And it is strong work. Um, wow. Sadie, I want to use Sadie Doyle's words here because I think they're so brilliant. Mercedes McCambridge gave the most hardcore performance of the entire horror genre, maybe of the century. And she wasn't even listed in the credits. I ask you, if this were Christian Bale, would we ever stop hearing about how hardcore that performance is, how fucking method it is, how brave mm -hmm. she was, how great, how terrifying she was? And I think, I think Sadie hits the nail on the head Sadie, there. that's wise words. Yeah. I, I was like, yeah, Sadie's got a point. So eventually Mercedes sued Warner Brothers and then the Screen Actors Guild intervened and the studio was forced to include her in the credits, but it took her decades to be included are in the you credits. Are kidding? Yeah. So if, if we are to believe what's his face, it was a mistake, we didn't have time. Great, correct it. Correct it. Correct That's it. why I think that is a load of mm -hmm. portion. And also that she changed her mind. I was like, no. Um, 
But it's weird. Here's the weird thing about all of it. And maybe the world has changed significantly since I joined Screen Actors Guild. When you are, you receive an offer to work on anything, film and television, the first thing you know is how much you're getting paid and what your credit is. But that may not have been the case. I think you're right. You know what I mean? I think that SAG has fought for those rights to be more clear all the time. And, um, and I think you're probably benefiting from fights like this. It's amazing. I mean, she left it all on the dance floor. You know what else it remind me of sides bark? Did you ever see the documentary? It's called 20 feet from stardom. Mm, I know which one you're talking about. It's about backup singers. Uh And there's a woman named Mary Clayton who like (laughs) she was in bed, curlers in her hair, falling asleep. I think she was pregnant and she gets a phone call that the Rolling Stones are in town. They're recording this album. And would she come and sing back up on a song? And you bet your ass. She hauled it up Popped out of right bed up. and got down to that recording studio, rollers in her hair and sings back up on um, a song called Gimme Shelter. And she made a decision where she was like, she was like, I'm going to blow their minds and I'm leaving it all on the dance floor. Yeah. And she sure did and in the documentary they had they it's one of my favorite parts of the documentary she's sitting (laughs) hashtag spoiler alert she's sitting in a studio as you know years years decades later and they just play her isolated backup track while she listens to it and she sings that track and she 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 tears it to shreds. Like mm-hmm. she leaves it all on the dance floor. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me of Mercedes McCambridge's performance. Wow. And then to not be credited. And then to not get any. I know. Oh. For years. But lest you think that an alcoholic endangering themselves by drinking again or swallowing 18 raw eggs or being tied up or strangled to do a voiceover or not being credited for their hard work or the possibility of real demon possession is the most disturbing part of the story. I'm here to tell you, it gets scarier. Stop. Stop. There's more. It's a spooky Halloween episode, oh, Kimmy. Shit. Um, I was like, I'm handling this pretty well. Well, get ready. As I was digging into the spark and researching it and following the breadcrumb trail uh-huh. around the internet, this trap door that I was not expecting opened and oh boy. I fell through it. Okay. And then I was afraid to turn off the lights. Oh, God. I got f- for real scared. It is the true life story of Mercedes McCambridge's son, John Markle. Oh, no. John Markle was a futures trader who worked at a firm called Stevens Incorporated. And he sounded like an eccentric dude. He wore like to work in like, you know, a financial services firm. He wore rumpled clothes or like white socks instead of, you know, black mm-hmm. dress socks. <laughs> on one occasion, a coworker spotted him taking a nap on a bench in front of his office at work. Hmm. Um, so he sounded like he was kind of an eccentric guy, but well-regarded, a well-regarded businessman and well-regarded mm-hmm. uh, by his associates. So John Markle was married to Christine Markle, who um, a- active mom in the neighborhood, community activities, volunteer with the Girl Scouts, other activities uh, for her kids. They, two little girls, Suzanne, the youngest, fourth grader, ballet, dance classes, close to her big sister, Amy, Amy, eighth grader, um, excellent student, wanted to be a dancer. So John Markle began working at Stevens in March 1979. His job responsibilities included consistently monitoring movements in the esoteric futures market. An associate said that Markle was probably one of the most respected men in the market. Mm. Um, But trouble arrived in the fall of 1987 as Stevens became aware of a report by one of its clients that suggested that John Markle manipulated a secret account in the name of his mother. And apparently what he would do is John Markle would place an order and then he'd wait until the end of the trading day before indicating which account the order was for. If the order showed profits, it went to the McCambridge account. And if it reflected losses, it was entered into the Stevens account. So he was like gaming the system. Very clever. A day after the report was given to um, the, the firm where he worked, 
Stephen's representatives confronted Markle, and he was placed on medical leave with the company citing a history of heart problems. I guess Markle had suffered a heart attack two years earlier, but that was the spin. That was the mm-hmm. story that pre- they, they presented. So during the week of November 9th, 1987, more information was discovered, which ultimately led to Markle's firing on Friday, November 13th, 1987, Mm. Friday the 13th. Markle tried to settle the account by asking that $800,000 of his mother's assets be placed into a Stevens account with his mother receiving interest on the income until she died. And at that point, the money would revert back to the Stevens firm. That proposal was rejected by Stevens, and the company instead said it would consider legal action unless it received $1 million in restitution. Markle was given 30 days to work on the restitution before action would be taken. So he had 30 days to pay $1 million to the firm. And throughout all of this, John Markle was planning. On November 9th, 1987, Markle checked with his insurance company to determine whether his policy contained an effective suicide clause. According Mm. to the Associated Press reportings at the time, the clause gave $500,000 to Mercedes McCambridge. On Friday, November 13th, 1987, though they didn't normally rent horror movies, Markle and his wife rented two movies at RAO Video for a Freddy party that his daughters had planned. And one of those movies was A Nightmare on Elm Street. And that movie was found in a VCR in a playroom on the second floor of the home. On November 15th, a man matching Markle's description walked into a store in Little Rock, Arkansas, where they lived, and bought an expensive old man Halloween mask. And the the clerk said, he gave me an uneasy feeling that something wasn't right. It, the mask was dark-skinned. It had a partly bald head and a big nose, as well as some salt and pepper hair and a mustache. Um, according to newspaper reports, the clerk said, He looked like he knew what he came in for. In the middle of the night, on November 16th, 1987, with the cover of a violent thunderstorm raging outside that was knocking out power and blowing down trees, John Markle put on that Halloween mask Mm -mm. and he shot and killed his wife, his two daughters, and then himself. Oh my God. Yeah. Scary. Mm-mm. Yeah, it's it's so dark. Um, oh my god! Are you okay? Yeah, I'm just thinking. So, but before he did that, he made sure his mom would get money. He made sure somebody would get like somebody would get something. But my question is, why do you have to? Can you why? imagine if you're his wife, and like you're up laying on the waterbed upstairs? And you hear a sound and you open your eyes and standing in the doorway is this masked. I have a picture of the mask. It's Uh, just like, it's, or uh, if you're one of those little girls, it's like, why do you have to make the last moments of this person? uh, Number one, why do you have to take their lives? And number two, why do you have to, did you not want them to know it was you? Did you want them to be terrified of an intruder and a home invasion? Like, yeah, I guess like, not have them look at you like, why, Dad? What are you doing? Yeah, I, it, it, it. I when I started reading this, I truly could not sleep. It was so scary to me. It makes me want to know, like, did he have a troubled life all the way up to that point? Well, let's take <gasps> a deeper look. So, oh, um, God. so they found him on the first floor study. Mm-hmm. Suicide. Um, the girls were upstairs in the oldest daughter's bedroom. They were probably sleeping in the same bedroom because of the thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. And the wife was in her bedroom, in their master bedroom. Um, Three guns in total were used to carry out these, the three slayings and the suicide. 18 firearms were taken in as evidence from the home. They had 18 firearms in the home. That's too many. That's too many firearms. I'm sorry. And then near him in his little home office was the blood splattered full face rubber Halloween mask. And it was like rolled up as if it had just been like rolled up and off and removed. And he'd said, Oh, he took it off when he killed himself. Yeah. 
So in addition to his suicide oh, note, John God. Markle's diary and other case-related documents were eventually released and shared in the press. What? And among the files released was a 12-page letter from Markle to his mother that blamed her, blamed her for the financial woes and personal faults that ultimately led him to kill his wife and children and, children. and take his own life. So he, like, before he left... Uh, before he left, he was like, here, I like put all of that shit on, on his you. mother. Now you try living with this. Oh, I just hate it. It's I, awful. And I'm sure like having an alcoholic mother is, I'm sure there's a lot to this story. Yes. But he sounded like a very um, troubled guy, depressed very guy. angry. Angry. Oh. Um, while records showed that McCambridge received more than half of her son's estimated $890,000 estate when he died. John Markle's former employer, Stevens, filed a lawsuit against Mercedes McCambridge seeking to recover $5 million <gasps> it lost from improper trading activities by Markle. And in its lawsuit, the firm did not accuse McCambridge of any wrongdoing, but said she was unjustly enriched as a result of the scheme. And in a settlement, the company recovered nearly $1.2 million. So I feel like this guy, this very unhappy guy, for whatever reason, did this horrific thing and then create, just left a giant mess for his and mother. it seems intentionally. It seems to be like, you clean this up. damaging. You will yeah. pay for this. Yeah. So Mercedes McCambridge lost her son, daughter-in-law and two grandchildren in this violent act and then was blamed for her son sued by his employer and this all sent her into hiding i can imagine but she did offer this public statement mm -hmm. this is it about what happened that's all there is to say it happened a greek tragedy a cast of four beautiful people the play closed thank you for caring The world will remember The Exorcist as one of the most significant horror movies of all time. Sadly, much of the true horror occurred in real life. Oh, Blackwell. Oh. That Isn't was that like a punch in the gut Cam's? after being scared to pieces. I, Ugh. sorry to be dark and scared. Spooky, but this is a spooky, it's a spooky episode, episode of the Spark File, and uh. and I'm just like, okay, so what do you make of it? What do you make of it? And I'm like, first of all, Ryan Murphy, if you're listening, I know you did like you do stories about whether it's American Gianni, Horror yeah, story. yeah, but yep. but also like Gianni Versace or or yep. um, what do they call it? Feud, where it's about like Betty yes, Davis yes. and. Mercedes yeah. McCambridge is worth a look. Anybody who wants to write about somebody, Hollywood lore, somebody who's really, really had an interesting life. Rich with detail. Rich My God. and dark and fascinating. Yes. Um, I feel like it's, and she wrote an autobiography. So there's, there's a lot of good source material, even though her name is not a household name. I feel like there would be a lot of good source material that people could draw from. Yes. Someone get the rights to her. Yeah. Autobiography. But also, I mean, I took it into a, you know, I do enjoy some true crime. Of course. And I took it into a true crime area, but it is, um, this John Markle thing is a fat, I wonder, I don't know that anybody has made anything out of this story. I mm -hmm. couldn't find it, but um, I thought it was just fascinating. It really Here's is. Here's the thing I want to say, and this is, applies to your spark and it applies to my spark. People feel, there are people that feel like because of like financial adversity, mm -hmm. it will never get, it couldn't possibly, life couldn't be worth living right. it couldn't get better so i'm going to take right. myself out or i'm going to take That's myself right. out and i'm taking my family with them to spare them the shame and pain no it you can it does get better you can rebuild a life you don't have to like mm -hmm. you don't have to go on a spree you don't have to take people out with you well i agree with i agree with you 
A, you never have to take anyone with you. Um, but B, there's to me like a slight difference between you experiencing financial hardship and wanting to end things because of it versus knowing you have cheated, lied, broken the law, yeah. brought other people with yeah. you into this. And that I don't know what that level of guilt feels like, certainly. Again, you don't need to take anyone with you. But if it's Bernie Madoff or if it's what's his name here, you you know, he they're responsible for a lot more than simply losing their own money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or not having money in the bank, which is its own stress and its own issue. Um but I feel like there's guilt in there that we don't even like we can't even understand. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I'm fascinated by these characters. I'm amazing. fascinated by these characters. And I can imagine, I look at what Jordan Peele is doing where he is taking sort of just almost cultural truths and stories that we live with and he makes horror out of them. And I think this could be a real, this is The Shining. This is um, Amityville Horror. This could be something really it's just because we don't just because we don't do the horror genre doesn't mean a listener couldn't take this and make something really good and scary out of it it's also possibly like a mommy dearest because Uh, you know what was their relationship that led up to this point point. do you know what i mean and what do we think we know about her versus what he experienced of her as a mother yes um yeah there's all of that. And then there's also some kind of question about like, it's funny, we, we started this episode talking about how we don't like to court the darkness and invite it <laughs> we in. We do it all the time. <laughs> but I mean, we talk about it, but I think this is a different level. Yeah. She, she danced with the devil. She did not court darkness. Yeah. She went all the way yeah. there for that movie. For her art and for, for her, work. her art and for her work. Yeah. And I do think there are people who are, who especially now I think things have changed in terms of like work conditions and what you would find appropriate to ask people to do. Would they? Would they? Maybe. If you're, if you're, um, if you're Adrian Brody and you're, people are still doing hardcore shit like this for film, especially film performances. Yeah. I think certainly some people are, but I do think like there are people who would draw the line at a different place if they have a choice. And some would say, I don't think I want that job badly enough to have to do that. Yeah. And some might say, Oh, I'm so excited by this opportunity that would, that would push me to go all the way. So know yourself as an artist, know yourself as an artist. And, um, I think in terms of like, what you could make out of it. I think there is an exploring of that question of like, if you court the darkness, can you control it once it's in? Can you control where it goes after it's arrived? Yeah. I don't know. There's something. I know. There's so much. There's so so much. It's so spooky. It's super spooky. And what do you think? Do you think we want to, um, park the darkness for another year until next Halloween and try not to go to the scary town. Well, it's interesting because we have done a few sparks that are a little dark scary. Sparks. We've done some dark sparks. These are scary in a different way. These are scary in a different way for sure. For, you know, in the, in yeah. the name of a Halloween holiday. Um, Just a few days past but, Halloween. Mm. <laughs> But yeah, I think I probably will. I don't know. I'll probably do a few dark ones here and there. We'll see where the sparks take us. Out. But for me, like when the last dark one that I remember doing was, um, ooh, Towns That Drown. Yeah. And this idea of a horror story yeah. based on, you know, the people under the water. Yes. And for me, this little project of ours, this spark file is super fun because I can be sparked by some of this dark stuff and share it with someone who is pass it on fit, (laughs) pass it on the perfect fit to spend the, you know, six months, you know, in that world and focusing on that world and making it come to life. And I welcome it and I'll support that movie that you make out of it. Maybe not by going to it, but 
I'll celebrate it in I my can. own way. I'll try to watch it through an Afghan, through and the tiny Susan holes And Susan will read Afghan. the Wikipedia That's right. synopsis of that film you make. That's right. So please make it. I think I told you this story one time about how when we were um, in college, I did this thing to my roommate. It was so crazy. I'm not inclined. I don't pull <laughs> pranks on people. I don't do this kind of thing. But she, we ha- shared a bedroom and she was in the walk-in closet and the only light on in the room was coming from the walk-in closet that cast its light onto the foot of my bed and down the bed. I was tucked into bed <laughs> under my black, I had this goth black cotton comforter that I thought was so badass. And I, I was tucked in and just my head was showing. So I just was laying in like, kind of like that. I'm just in a, um, in a sarcophagus sort of just... And I was laying there and she was in the closet just talking to me. And I don't know what possessed me, but since I was little, I have practiced in the mirror making the scariest faces that I can with my face. And I was just like, I just put my face into one of the scary faces that I know I can make <laughs> and waited for her to turn around and see you me in the bed. so mean. She jumped out of her skin. Oh, oh my Denise God. Stepman, I love you. May you rest in peace because she did pass away. But it's not oh. because I scared her. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. But I say your that. name, a prayer, Denise Stepman, as I remember you. Um, oh, this is a 100% haunted episode. You can't escape it, Camion. <laughs> I'm struggling. <laughs> you can't. That's it. That's it. We're going to get well, out of it Happy Halloween. Happy, happy days after Halloween. Happy days after Halloween. We, I hope you had a good one. We hope this put another bunch of pumpkin sparks in your file. If there's a spark that you'd like us to explore, or if you've taken a spark and you fed it into a haunted flame, and you'd like to share it with us, won't you email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our web spot. Or submit it through our web spike. <laughs> that just in time for Halloween. The sparkfile.com. We'll even take your feedback. <laughs> but you know the price of admission. This is so ridiculous. Thanks for hanging in with us. Uh, first, you got to share a creative risk that you've taken recently. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe, rate, five star review it. If you like this podcast, Share it with people you love. If you didn't like it, that's okay. It'll be our spooky secret. (laughs) (laughs) If something tickles your fancy and gets your creative juices flowing, by all means, please, please make that thing that's been knocking at your door. We're giving you a... Knocking with a haunted (laughs) skeleton hand. (laughs) And a big old antique knocker. (laughs) We're writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing. So it's your turn to take a spark and fan it into a flame. You got to mine it. You got to define it. You got to marry Shelly that shit and (laughs) full on Frankenstein it. (laughs) You got to take it and and make it. 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 <laughs> this has been a fully themed episode of the Spark File. Please forgive us. Oh. <laughs> when I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my Spark File. Could be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Spark File. I jump into my spark fire. fire. Let's Let's open open up the spark fire. If you or someone you know are experiencing suicidal thoughts, call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. Hi friends, Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or 
an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. Illum.